Okay, well, this thing is working magically. Well, thank you. And it's uh, really great to be here. And uh, I personally, I uh, have appreciated all the speeches so far. So for me, this is a great conference. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone, for uh, uh, providing uh, us with all these uh, great talks. And of course, uh, special thanks to David Hook, a previous speaker. Without uh, David's work, we wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be no EGBCA. So that's uh, very nice to have that kind of a crowd here. <clears throat> so I'll better get on uh, with my work. Uh, so hardcore PKI. So what's this? So it's uh, the, the three years now that we had uh, tech days. We had, or I had this uh, recurring theme presentation. You know, we had uh, Marcus and Mike and others who presented our products and Martin, while I uh, keep on the kind of uh, um, more strange stuff, so to say. So uh, with hardcore PKI, I try to summarize more or less what I think has been the hardcore about PKI in the last uh, past year or so. Uh, so yeah, now we're at 2017. So I'm going to start with a short uh, recap. Uh, hello, metalheads. And <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I think text is visible. Uh, so this was a recap from 2015. What uh, did I think was hardcore back then? Well, there was uh, pretty much, as Dan uh, mentioned in the last uh, presentation, you know, there's uh, was 14 standards and we need a new one, so now we have 15. Uh, so that uh, was one of the hardcore things uh, back in 2015. Uh, and uh, different ways of setting up PKI, everyone wants a different one, etc. There's hundreds of different options. Uh, to tune after your uh, your personal preference and your use case, your special use case, because that's one of the interesting things with PKI is that since it's an infrastructure, it's used for uh, you know anything, uh, from code signing to uh, public SSL to uh, VPNs or payment terminals, you name it. Um, so that was 2015, and back in uh, 2016, we had a more updated the guitarist. And uh, back then I thought, okay, we have all this stuff and the hard thing, uh, hardcore is actually to piecing it out, piecing it together. You know, we have things on the edge uh, and the platform in the enterprise, uh, which are, can be pretty, uh, pretty spread out and uh, dispersed. So how to keep kind of a red thread through your whole uh, system in order to make a workflow fit together without too much hassle. And uh, then were some new standards again. Uh, so that was hardcore in 2016. So uh, let's get to 2017. So what did I uh, think uh, up this time? Uh, well, a new picture. And uh, pretty much, I would say, I'm not too far off from uh, some of other presenters here. So uh, compliance is pretty hardcore PKI. I mean, it, and it's uh, not uh, technical stuff, as uh, Scott mentioned. Well, part of it is technical stuff, but it's everything about uh, being compliant to different things. There's uh, audit standards. There's technical standards, and there's even software, and uh, you know the systems we use. And uh, one thing that has become more hardcore uh, than before, I would say, is that things are changing a lot faster. So back in uh, 2001, when uh, you know I started DGBC, and in 2002 when we started PrimeKey. You could live comfortably for you know ten years with RFC 5280 and uh, SHA one. Uh, then things started picking up pace, kind of attacks. Uh, new uh, well, we still have RFC 5280 with just some minor errata, 
but apart from that, um, standards are working pretty fast. So we'll go uh, dig a little bit into that. I'm just trying to figure out if I can understand how the clock works on this screen. Uh. So first, uh, audit standards. So what uh, do we mean by that? As I mentioned, uh, compared to five years ago, uh, audit compliance regulations are way, way harder than it used to be. Uh, back in the digging out our days, you could be web trust compliant without um, doing too much, I think. Uh, nowadays, being able to keep yourself be without being janked from the uh, browsers is a lot of uh, job, which I think everyone here who runs a public CA can uh, vet for. Uh, the same with other things, like uh, in Europe, we had the old kind of Etsy standards for uh, uh, qualified certificates for something like 10 years, didn't change much. Uh, no one was happy with it, but didn't change. Uh, then uh, now come ADAS and uh, a lot of things, and it's uh, evolving a lot faster. And there's even then industry standards, you know, for a grid, cloud, uh, IoT, there's going to come new audit regulations for sure. For example, within IoT, there's uh, sure to be some uh, new stuff coming out to be compliant with in certain industries. Uh, probably, uh, I mean, for Siemens, within critical infrastructure, there's going to be a lot of new things. So some of the things uh, we're working with, of course, uh, which, or which are very acute, so to say, that are, of course, Web Trust and Cab Forum, uh, public CAs, that's uh, big, changing really fast. Uh, we have EDAS, which are, of course, uh, recently starting to be introduced, uh, so which are actually uh, making a lot of change, uh, changes in Europe. So those of you not from Europe, as we mentioned, you don't have to care, but... Uh, it can also, probably it will lay um, together, you know, Web Trust Cab Forum and AIDAS kind of lays a foundation how uh, modern trust centers uh, are run today. Uh, we have other things like in the e-passport and uh, EID area. We have ICAO, uh, International Civil Air Organization, who sets standards and regulations around that. Uh, of course, we have the certificate transparency stuff and then we have uh, also cloud IoT uh, grid security standards and things like that. So, but, well, maybe it doesn't affect any everybody. So, uh, how does it affect me, you may ask, if you're not running a public CA? Uh, well, a lot of things, both, so to say, Issuance to either public first persons or public facing services or even internal services, but you run it on common uh, applications and operating systems, so you want it to verify smoothly, etc. So you want to somehow uh, issue to these. Or if you're operating in a regulated industry, so this all of this affects you somehow. So basically, uh, you will be affected if. Uh, well, you won't be affected perhaps if you're running just your internal private PKI for your uh, own purpose. Then you may might get away with it. But otherwise, if you're doing anything like TLS, email, code signing, digital signatures, time stamping, uh, there's a lot of things to pay attention to. Actually, you have to be, uh, uh, be a bit on your toes and uh, see what's happening out there. Uh, Recurring theme as well. So, what are the details? So, now, uh, of course, uh, from uh, Prime Key, I will give you some nice screenshots from EDBCA mostly. Uh, so, these are e passport uh, details that you have to be aware of if you're uh, anywhere in this type of industry. So, and there's been actually a lot of changes here, uh, of course. Uh, say from the beginning, we only had uh, kind of this row here when we first started with ePassport, and there was only inspection systems, so there won't, weren't any options either. Uh, then they started doing uh, new stuff, so of course we have to use the same technology, which was a good choice, 
same technology for EIDs and uh, residence permits. So then we need some new options so you can see, okay, what kind of document, I mean document that's an EID card or e-passport e in this uh, language. Then you can specify, okay, what type of document is it? Is this a passport or an ID card or an e-residence card? Is that a residence permit? Things like that. So it added a lot of options. Uh, then there was a bunch of other options uh, to see uh, not only passport inspection systems, but also for digital signature terminals or authentication terminals. And then uh, pretty not too short, you see a uh, scroll list there with different options to choose from. So if you're running a PKI like this, uh, well, you you should have to understand what all these options are. Uh, and uh, I think as someone else mentioned as well, the US uh, who is running this, you must understand it. Uh, we're providing the options, which are plentiful, uh, but we don't know how you apply it in your environment and uh, for your policies, etc. cetera. Uh, some other changing details. Uh, we have the EIDAS, of course. Uh, it used to be qualified uh, certificates have been around in Europe for a long time. Uh, started changing uh, a couple of years ago with EIDAS. Uh, from the beginning, it only, can I think it went down here, down to retention period. So the rest of the stuff is, well, these parts are uh, new for EIDAS. In order to issue compliance certificates, you have to add some new options to your certificates and uh, issue new ones, kind of. And of course, you have to know what kind of types of certificates you issue. There's now uh, three types, uh, signatures, seals, and uh, web. I probably no one is starting to issue web certificates yet. I'm not sure uh, how's that going to be. Uh, but you also have this uh, policy disclosure statement, so you need to uh, author a couple of nice documents, uh, which can be in different languages, etc., and uh, publish them. And it should be over HTTPS, of course. So you need the uh, SSL certificates there as well. Uh, Cab forum. Here's uh, where there's a kind of an onslaught of new features. Uh, these are just the uh, recent ones. Uh, the CAA. Uh, validation as uh, we've heard about, which are quite complex. So this there's going to be more settings here. This will expand when you know the real world uh, use cases uh, or usage of uh, CA uh, on the internet. And uh, there's also uh, requirements on key quality. So there's uh, both. Now this example is for RSA. There's also one for ECC, but that actually only has one option. So that one is nice. Uh, but there's a bunch of requirements on the public key, uh, minimum value for the public key exponent, maximum value for the uh, public key exponent, if you want to allow odd modulus, uh, power of primes, uh, smallest factor, and things like that. So now these are kind of preset from uh, the Cab Forum current, I would say, Cab Forum guidelines. Uh, I mean, they may change as well. Then you have to go in and uh, change these options. So this will, uh, whenever a certificate is to be issued by EDBCA, you can run it through this validation to see, okay, if the public key fulfills these requirements, otherwise it's uh, denied or logged or uh, or both, etc. And uh, even more from the public trust, we have certificate transparency, which is getting getting old by now. It's been around for a year and a half or something like that. Uh, but there's uh, a bunch of options there as well. Oh. Uh, you can use it in different ways. Now, probably most use it uh, to, uh, to embed these SCTs in certificates so that as they are issued. But you can choose uh, uh, how many maximum and minimum numbers uh, we're going to have to add uh, as well, you know, as which logs are mandatory and which logs are optional. Because as we heard, there's a minimum two required, but it's also kind of, a, it has to be a minimum uh, two logs uh, which fulfill certain criteria, and one of them has to be from Google, things like that. And even more, 
we have audit uh, requirements. That's what I call it here. But uh, this is a screenshot of a bit of workflow configuration, how to approve things. Uh, in some scenarios, you don't, you're not allowed to issue certificates unless you, it has gone through a uh, specified approval and documented approval process. So you can specify different steps a request has to go through, uh, you know, gathering evidence of who is requesting, the organization is okay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so probably, I mean, uh, in many cases you have to, mm, you know, go through all these screens and configure it how you want it to work or how your policy says it works. And you have to uh, keep up to date with what Google decides to change for uh, CT, what Cab Forum decides to uh, change for key quality or uh, CAA. Mm, if AIDAS makes any changes, uh, then you have to yeah, keep track of these. And there's a bunch of different organizations making different decisions. Um, um, hopefully, they're not too often conflicting, but who knows? Uh, so the tough thing is actually to keep up to date with this. I mean, how how will you be notified if uh, Cab Forum changes uh, the minimum uh, factor of RSA modulus? Well, you probably have to monitor Cab Forum or have someone who does it in your organization. The same with uh, e-passport, e ICAO. They are also now. I didn't have that here, but there are also a lot of discussions around CRM handling and uh, different uh, uh, districts. You can have the same country code, but different uh, CAs, etc. So you need uh, locality names, uh, certain pattern, and but everything should be on the same CRL in some cases, uh, things like that. So then you have to. Uh, try to keep ahead with what ICAO is doing. Uh, so moving on, that's not only audit standards, we also have uh, technical standards. They are also evolving fast. Uh, so, and oh, as we heard from other presenters, it's uh, moving faster and yeah, in an ideal world, world we would have uh, crypto agility, so we can could plug and play uh, different algorithms. I would say in, uh, right now we're not there, right? I doubt that anyone is. So because first, yeah, you have to standardize SHA-3 and then it can be implemented. I mean, Bouncy Castle will definitely be way ahead of us implementing SHA-3 and then we'll uh, put it some options in EGBCA. If Bouncy Castle has it, technically it will be simple, but there also has to be some uh, GUI and uh, localization and things like that. And uh, I mean, some organizations are uh, able to move very fast. Some organizations are not able to move very fast. So there's still, uh, as I was talking uh, uh, over coffee here just before, there's still a lot of legacy out there. There's still XP out there. There's still uh, things like uh, payment terminals who's been sitting in you know, the tobacco shop since it was uh, provided there 10 years ago, things like that. So that's, uh, uh, it's not just a snap of the finger and you have new algorithms, etc. Uh, it's not so easy for everyone. Uh, and of course, uh, also existing standards are being used in new ways, even though uh, PKI is currently one of the most uh, widespread technologies and security is becoming more and more um, used. So we are inventing new use cases. So if things change uh, quickly, we need to uh, also adapt quickly. So these are just a couple of examples of uh, what has happened. I mean, SHA-1, SHA-256, that's kind of over now. There's going to be a, a SHA-3 RSA, uh, and there's a bit of push to ECC, at least in uh, different sectors. They all trust the PKCS1, which uh, still, I think, is considered secure, but people want to use uh, the PSS uh, padding scheme. Uh, 
And of course, different protocols. We had SCP, who doesn't do ECC well, so we have CMP and we have EST, EST, which we'll hear more about. Of course, not to mention TLS. It has been you know, SSL v3 to TLS 1.0. That took ages, years. Then it was quick, you know, 1.1, 1.2. And then, well, hopefully we'll, we can wait then, uh, a little longer for 1.3, but it's been going fast. And uh, the same with EID, you know, EID, uh, e-driver's license, e-residence permit, new things, fast. So, details. Uh, these are details that specifically for this, uh, it's called Charter and Fit 6 with RSA and MGF1, but that's the um, PSS, RSA PSS padding scheme for digital signatures. I mean, it's also, it's been around for, I don't know how long, 10 years probably. Uh, but uh, things like Java, except for if you use Bouncy Castle, it's been also implemented for ages. But if you want to use uh, plain standard Java, Oracle Java, or OpenJDK, and if you want to use it uh, using their PKSS 11 provider, no, you couldn't do that. So we had to patch, uh, make patches ourselves. Uh, Marcus has been patching that for. Uh, bunch of years and of course we submitted our patches to Java for can you please put this in so the whole world can use RSA PSS out of the box. Uh, well, it uh, took five, six years or so now they say they have done it. Uh, we haven't seen the proof yet, so still remains to be tested. But we got a uh, notice uh, just a couple of weeks ago that uh, uh, it would be in. Well, we're, we're hopeful. Uh, yeah, that's uh, crypto, of course. There's been uh, well, since 2007, I think, when we started with the e-passports. Then there was uh, kind of starting to be some use cases for ECC or people actually using it in reality. And now it's been moving faster and faster, industry, IoT, uh, etc. But uh, yeah. EC elliptic curve cryptography isn't that when you want to choose which curves you want to use, etc. Uh, you have a quite uh, a large selection to choose from. And the same there, you know, some of the things are implemented uh, quite easily and will work uh, everywhere with you. Probably if you use like this, these uh, NIST curves. Uh, Three of them probably that will work interoperably, interoperable, in a nice way across different platforms. If you use anything else, well, you better test carefully where for uh, what your use case is, if it's going to work or not. Uh, well, the same there. We had to maintain. Uh, so Brain pool is a German elliptic curve uh, created by Teletrust, so it's um, widely used in uh, e-passport, EID. <laughs> that kind of things, and uh, probably also in other areas. But of course, uh, Java being from the other side of the pond doesn't uh, automatically support uh, these curves. So it's uh, the same there. Uh, we've been patching uh, Java to provide that. Uh, options, of course, TLS going really fast there. I mean, you from one day to the other, you have to enable or disable some Cypher suites in TLS to not be downgraded on your uh, you know, SSL uh, scan. So these are just a couple that we have uh, as default selections out of the box. Um, other properties, OCSP, used to nothing happen in OCSP for 10 years, and all of a sudden, OK, oops, we need some new options. So from the beginning, it used to say, OK, if the OCSP responder didn't know if a certificate was issued or not, it's probably good, right? It probably was issued and it's not revoked. It just wasn't published to the OCSP responder. Then uh, that didn't work anymore because, uh, well, there could have been uh, malicious issuance. And then you wanted to treat that as revoked. If someone managed to issue a malicious certificate, uh, which the CA didn't know about, well, we better mark it as revoked because I don't know about it. Then it came up, okay, but then you can actually kind of send a lot of requests to the OCSP responders and they 
we'll have to do a lot of uh, signatures. So uh, now we also have the option of uh, existing is unauthorized, which just returns an HTTP error code uh, instead of actually signed OCSP response, so, which of course is uh, instant and doesn't cause any uh, digital signature operations. Um, so new options appearing uh, all the time. Uh, the same even with the CMP, you know, we have to regular CMP, then you want to do a key update, uh, certificate renewal, maybe the same keys or not. Uh, new thing that I think we most mentioned yesterday, uh, server generated keys, you want to use that as well, probably RSA and ECC, so new options. Uh, options, options, options. And uh, for things that once in a while you didn't think uh, anyone would care about uh, which if the uh, which order your uh, L and ST uh, component in the DN is in? Well, it turns out, of course, someone does. When uh, you use something in a thousand different use cases, you find out quickly that there's always someone who cares about something that you didn't think anyone should care about. Uh, so you have a kind of a, what I tried to say here, uh, is that in some aspect you have to see what the user is requesting and uh, take it into account, otherwise it will not work for them. At the same time, you never trust what the user sends to you, because that can quote, uh, lead to uh, vulnerabilities. As we had, well, there was one in SCEP where a CA would actually take the request from that came from a phone, issue a certificate with the information that was in the certificate request, uh, which meant even though, okay, there was kind of a portal that you had to enter uh, the name that was supposed to be right, but, uh, well, if you were tricky, you could actually put anything in your certificate request and get a certificate for uh, Bill Clinton or whatever you wanted. Um, so never trust what the user uh, sends you, but still uh, see what it sends because you need to use some information from it. Uh, next part, software changes as well, of course. Uh, there's a lot more discussion on threats today, so uh, software responds to threats a lot faster than it used to be. Uh, internet uh, it used to be so nice, we didn't have to uh, you know, firewall our machines in the 90s, everyone was nice and uh, cuddling. Uh, not so anymore. So we have your standard software will respond to threats and disable mechanisms that uh, you, you thought were, you know, would live forever. forever. Like SHA-1, blocked by web browsers, uh, RSA 1024, which still isn't broken, but it will give warnings. Uh, servers start to require TLS 1.1 or higher, uh, which means even uh, that you have to I mean, Java 7, oops, now I did what everyone else says. So, I mean, Java 7 is still widely used, but um, if you want to use connect to another server who's on TLS 1.1, well, you should use some other library than standard Java, or you have to upgrade your Java, etc. So, I put some uh, notable examples uh, of software changes that affect a lot of people. Uh, one is the key gen tag which we mentioned was removed in Chrome and, well, Edge never had any browser enrollment. Uh, it's hard to replace. You need a real token management system, which, of course, if you manage tokens on a large scale, you should probably have a real token management system anyhow. But if you want to do it in small scale for a couple of administrators, the keygen tag was kind of uh, neat and useful. Uh, not replacing, if you have a large organization, your problem, uh, you might have found out that you had some servers still using a SHA-1 certificate somewhere, which was blocked, stopped working. Uh, that means you have to update uh, certificates. Um, well, one thing that has happened to a couple of uh, customers, publishing to CT log servers, turns out uh, some of them are starting to require TLS 1.2, 
uh, but they were still running on Java 7, so it will not connect. And of course, you don't get a error message, you know, in it in a TLS connection that says you're on uh, trying to uh, use TLS 1.1. We won't require TLS 1.2 or higher. It just says the stream closed, something like that. So you have to try to debug it. You can enable some debugging and figure it out. And systems, uh, SCEP is kind of, there's a lot of talk about SCEP nowadays. Uh, it's because, well, it doesn't support EC. Uh, so if your device, if you want to use EC uh, and your devices are uh, using SCEP, it won't work. So I have to change to something uh, newer, uh, more agile, etc. Uh, there's an attempt with an updated SCEP spec, but uh, EC support seems kind of hackish there, so I don't, uh, I would recommend to move to uh, more modern protocols, which we'll hear more about soon. Uh, so, some conclusions. I think Hardcore PKI 2017 is to keep up to date with all the changes in standards, uh, uh, audit requirements, software changes, uh, to not keep things from breaking. And it's uh, not easy at all, because you have to maybe upgrade a lot of components in your software stack, you have to implement uh, new requirements from standards and, so and auditors, and you even sometimes have to prove your results if you're audited, otherwise you would suffer. And uh, many of the, these things are not trivial to understand, uh, there are many cases not written, uh, so it's trivial to understand. So there's uh, different ways to interpret things. So maybe you try one approach first. Oh, no, that didn't work, so you have to try another approach. And you really have to keep on your toes. So how do you, uh, what do you have to do to get to the top? That kind of, you have to yeah, keep training. Uh, talking to people uh, like the, uh, our presenters here that are well informed, you have to plan actions well in time, uh, work with your vendors, etc. And uh, kind of keep a tight loop on from your architecture and operations perspective so you can be agile and move fast. And uh, well, you just never sleep. You have to st constantly sift through the thousands of emails from the different standardization organizations to try to figure out what's happening and how it affects me. And uh, well, for us, we can keep up to date with some aspects on our small little niche, but uh, in many cases, we also rely on, on uh, you guys to tell us, okay, this uh, organization, obscure organization, is making this change and uh, it's going to be needed soon. Uh, yeah. Do I have some more time? Okay, good. Because then I also, I don't want to skip out on the other uh, cool stuff as well. I also have to have blockchain. I said as told because, but now it has shifted, so we'll be told what we're playing with on blockchain. But I also, I must have slide on post quantum. Uh, <laughs> so what where do we mean with uh, post-quantum uh, crypto in PKI? So we had a uh, guy, Mike, Michael, doing a master thesis at PrimeKey around how to use post-quantum algorithms for digital signing and public key infrastructure. So that was uh, quite neat. So the goal was to find post-quantum digital signature algorithms that might be suitable for use in PKI, right? So he tried out uh, hash-based XMSS, uh, Sphinx, multivariable-based Rainbow, and lattice-based uh, Bliss B, and benchmarked them to see, okay, compared to our standard uh, PKI, how would this work? Uh, so this is last. So uh, what were the kind of conclusions? That was that uh, all these uh, algorithms, which you know, we're able, able to try out, have relatively large signature sizes and or key sizes. Uh, so if you compare to, if you're moving to ECC to have smaller keys, moving to post-quantum, uh, or at least 
most of the current uh, post-quantum algorithms uh, are going like the other direction. Uh, Bliss P offered the best performance, almost uh, on par with RSA and ECC. And uh, so there were some recommendations in the thesis that Sphinx uh, would be good for high security application and possibly Bliss B for lower security applications, but uh, to require higher efficiency. Of course, there's no uh, widespread, uh, widespread deployment. Uh, standardization is still to be done. So it's more of an uh, academic exercise to see, OK, well, there are things that are possible to use actually in uh, PKI as well. Uh, once they're standardized, then you know, we can start use it, using it. So since we are in applied cryptography, uh, we'll uh, just play around and uh, wait for standardization, and then uh, we're ready to move. Uh, well, and one interesting thing with this post-quantum uh, that I think was was that this uh, uh, you can kind of choose a little bit between very uh, secure and inefficient operations, and or you can have faster operations but with maybe uncertain security levels, uh, or both. So there's a lot more uh, variation in the at least in the current post quantum. Al algorithm words or world. So some algorithms might be nice for some use cases, but totally useless for others. So it's not as generic as our current uh, RSA and ECC, which you can use for everything, because they're fast, efficient, and secure. So maybe you have to use different algorithms for different use cases in the future. We'll see. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any final questions? Uh, this is actually a small area just uh, outside Stockholm. So it's a local crag. Absolutely. So I think there's a lot of work going on in PrimeKey right now. Uh, I mean, cloud is uh, one which is, you know, in that direction, obviously. Uh, but also for other deployment uh, scenarios. I mean, we also get questions: Do you support running in Docker? Sure, you can do that. I mean, it's tr tried, but you also want to standardize. Um, see if we can standardize uh, deployments in uh, either VMs, or Docker containers, etc., for kind of our and customer usages. So yeah, there's uh, uh, a lot of work on it. Because yeah, it's um, cool. I'm running uh, my on my laptop. I'm running my CA on the bare metal and uh, my RA in a container. On LXC, though, not the uh, Docker one. Okay, then thank you for listening. <laughs>